Should it all fail, the captain knows he can fall back on a trusty technology from a bygone era. We have 50 caliber machine guns that are manned by our crews here. Uh, we also have then layered defenses all the way down to the captain and the 9mm. The Midway's armored deck gives her the security she needs, but her aircraft are outdated. In the 1950s, Navy commanders want jets on their carriers. But these bigger, faster planes cannot land safely. It will take 10 years and an ingenious idea before jets can routinely land on the 81,000-ton USS Forrestal. In December 1945, a jet manages to land on a carrier for the first time. It is an extraordinary feat of flying by Eric Winkle Brown, the Royal Navy's top test pilot. That aircraft there is, is the aircraft that Winkle Brown landed in December 1945 and made carrier aviation with jet power uh, fundamental to, to any modern Navy. It also identified that there were a, a batch of new problems to be resolved. The main problem is speed. Faster jets leave their pilots less time to find the correct angle of approach. If they come in too steep, the aircraft will hit the deck too hard. But if their approach is too shallow, they may clip the stern of the ship. Engineers discover the optimum angle of approach for a safe landing is three degrees. But it's almost impossible for a pilot to get this right every time. In slower planes like the Hellcat, pilots have time to respond to instructions from a man on the flight deck who uses paddles to help guide them down. Former Royal Navy pilot Nick Goodhart explains how it's supposed to work. So we're curving in and um, he thinks I'm a little bit too high. So he makes a signal and I say, ah, oh, yes, a little too high. And I throttle back just a little bit and descend a bit. And then he said, no, 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 too low. <laughs> and I open the throttle a bit and uh, sure enough, we're on a reasonably good uh, landing track. and. Uh, I get near the round down, and just as I'm coming over the round down, he makes the signal cut. And I chop my throttle, and we descend gracefully onto the deck, and uh, uh, everybody's happy. At least that's the principle. But Goodhart discovers it to be a very dangerous procedure. In fact, we lost um, so many pilots that way that it exceeded by far the number who were killed by the enemy in the war. Appalled by such losses, Goodhart himself comes up with a simple idea that enables the pilot alone to find and follow the correct angle of descent. We've got this uh, rig set up here, which was the rig that I used originally in my boss's office. I set up a mirror, which I had borrowed from his secretary, on the carrier deck there, and that mirror has a, a line across it, made out of lipstick, to mark its middle. And I also had a torch, which we got here. So we set the torch up on the carrier as well. And then we invited his secretary to come in, and um, I said to her, look, now, your job is, as a pilot, is to see the reflection of the torch in the mirror and walk very slowly towards it, keeping the reflection on the line. By keeping the light level with the lipstick line, the secretary, like the pilot, will naturally follow the correct angle of descent. 
Translated onto a ship, this is what's happening. The torch is represented by four lights fixed to the deck. Beyond them is the mirror. A row of lamps represent the lipstick line. As the plane approaches, the beam from the deck lights reflects back to the pilot at an angle of three degrees. If the pilot keeps this reflection in the center of the mirror, he will come down at the right angle. But it's not as simple as that. At sea, a ship pitching in the waves throws the beam about, sometimes with devastating results. To stabilize the beam, they fix the mirror on a gyroscopic mount. Now a plane can safely follow the right line of descent, however rough the sea. Goodhart's mirror landing aid proves a great success, whatever the size and speed of the aircraft. It allows a whole new generation of supersonic fighters and nuclear-armed bombers to land on carriers. The Forrestal now truly deserves to be called the world's first supercarrier. Today on the Nimitz, they use an improved version of Admiral Goodhart's landing aid. Pilots call the central lamp in this row of lights the meatball. It is fitted with a special lens so that the approaching pilot can only see its light when he lines up his aircraft to come in at the correct angle. The mirror landing aid allows the USS Forrestal to carry the world's biggest and fastest Navy bombers. But as a fighting ship, she has a severe limitation. She runs out of fuel after only three days of action. The Navy searches for a new type of propulsion system. It is so massive that they must build a bigger ship to accommodate it. The 91,000-ton USS Enterprise. This is the start of one of the Navy's most dangerous operations, refueling at sea. A conventional fossil fuel carrier drains her tanks in about three days and then needs a pit stop. But this is no simple top up. The crew uses a pilot rope to pull across the fuel line. Then, once the line is connected, they transfer more than two million liters of fuel. But that's only enough for about 72 hours of sailing. The process ties the carrier to a slow tanker and leaves both vulnerable to attack by enemy aircraft and submarines. There must be a better way. One solution, harness the colossal energy released by the splitting of an atom to produce nuclear power. Scientists discover that firing particles at atoms of uranium loosens the bonds that hold their tiny components together. A chain reaction in the nuclear power plant in the bowels of the ship triggers a